Welcome, Amy Scruggs, to Coaching in Session. How are you doing today? I am great. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you, Michael. Of course. So today I have you as a media coach and recording artist. Can you go into a little bit more of, about the work you do and how you help people? I have a career that's been kind of eclectic for the last 20 years, starting in business and sales, business development. As you pointed out, I'm also a recording artist and toured nationally for years on the country music circuit and had the opportunity of being able to perform with some of my heroes in the music industry. And I also had those years in the wholesale mortgage and in business and sales industry. I learned very quick that effective communication, being able to present yourself was a key component to success as an artist and as a business professional. And five years ago, I actually had a beautiful opportunity of being placed in the driver's seat as a TV host for a national TV show where I was interviewing professionals from all walks of life, city leaders, community leaders, entrepreneurs, sales professionals, nonprofits, you name it. There was a common thread in there. Anytime I'd sit down with a professional that everybody has that same nerve before the camera goes on. A lot of people are uncomfortable in what they're going to share and is this okay and how do we do it? And so I found myself in the driver's seat as a host saying, I've got you, don't worry. Let me help you with this. I'm going to pull the best out of you. And most of those interviews were only about five minutes long. So I really had in a, a short amount of time to make sure they were comfortable and delivering the message that they came there to share. So I started coaching them right in the driver's seat, which opened up some opportunities for me to start coaching some of them outside of being in the studio. And I realized that there was just a beautiful opportunity there of professionals of all walks of life to level up their communications. I had no idea what was about to hit with COVID because <laughs> this was all prior Zoom, prior COVID. And I had these years of experience and said, wow, the entire world's on camera. Oh my goodness, it's time to take this the next level. And so over the last couple of years, I've really grown my coaching business as a media coach because this is now affecting everyone in their virtual meetings. Everyone wanting to be on great podcasts like yours. Everyone saying, I wanna get my message out there, but not quite knowing how to do it effectively. So alongside everything else, I was still hosting TV virtually. I recorded a new music project and launched new music on radio worldwide this past year, and I'm coaching professionals. So here we sit today to kind of talk about some of those tips and tricks and backgrounds and some of even the obstacles as an entrepreneur. This has not been an easy process, but it's been a constant ability to shift as the world threw things at me, even back in, in 08. When the recession hit, I was full-time in mortgage and real estate and in wholesale lending, and that job disappeared. So we have two choices to make. Do I bury my head in the sand or do I shift? And so taking on these different tools and abilities and skills and constantly putting them into my trade and my practice and being more efficient has opened up doors of opportunities I would have never dreamed of. And you brought up so many good points. So we're going to try to dissect all of them, hopefully in the order that you said them, but let's nah, go it's, back. It's fine. Any order doesn't matter. <laughs> let's go back. Let's bring it back to when you were younger. 2008 happened and you were doing real estate. And then today you're a media coach. Many people go through that transition where they think they found their purpose, their passion, their gift. And you're like, I'm supposed to be doing this. This is making the money. This is making me happy. This is making me fulfilled. But then we have an adjustment. We have a slight pivot we have to make, or we say, you know what? This was good for me then, but now I want to make a change today. Uh -huh. And when I speak with people, I'm always interested. Well, what was the process like for you going with your education, then going into your career? How did that look like? Because I have many people who might have one career their whole entire life. They right. maybe got into construction when they're 18 years old, and now they're 40 and they're still doing construction. And they call me and they say, hey, Mike, I'm just not happy. I'm just not fulfilled in my job. And I say, okay, well, let's figure that out. I think it helps people when they can hear other people's perspective and other people's stories and journey also from how they started from maybe how they were thinking back in high school to how they're thinking today when they're older and had many years of experience in many careers. You know, it's it's a really great point to make, Michael. If I even go back to high school, it's funny. I, I remember every report card my entire life said she talks too much. <laughs> and I was much happier in speech and debate. And I was in all these music classes and choirs and performing. The writing was on the wall that I wanted to speak and sing for a living. So I think that that was already ingrained 
but life happens. And that's not what happened out the gate. Now I had children very young, so I'm going to age myself here, but I have a gaggle of kids that are all grown now. (laughs) And so at 29, when I went through a life shift and I needed to provide for these kids, that was where I was introduced to the banking world and wholesale mortgage and sales. Mortgage was not my passion. It still is not to this day. What was my passion was working with other professionals, was realizing that through communication, through real networking and relationships, that I could make a difference even in that circle. And as I moved up quickly to be a sales manager, for me, it was the passion of helping my teammates to learn how to present in front of other businesses and to say, you can do this. There was always that discomfort being in front of people that I could help people overcome. And I would have never been able to identify at the time that that would be a future career for me. I just knew that that was the passion. And at the same time, I was always singing. I was in cover bands and concerts in the park and you name it, kids in tow. I was out there singing while still working in my career because those two always had to stay in line. At at three years old, I said I was going to be Barbara Mandrell when I grew up and I meant it. (laughs) This was the path I was going to take. And in 2004, while I was still fully in my sales career, I was flying back and forth to Nashville and was able to start some of that recording process. But in 07, life hit. And again, it's that shift. It's saying, okay, I have all these years of sales. I know how to run my business and be successful at this. I still have the passions and we're in a recession and I have mouths to feed. So why don't I take all of these things and combine them and see what happens? And not being afraid of the no, I think has been a big contributor. I'm not afraid to be told no because the yeses are always amazing. So I'll go out and keep asking. I'll keep asking. And I went out and started asking for the business as a recording artist. I put a band together and I went out and asked for the business. And six months later, I was opening for Clint Black on a national stage in Arizona on the 4th of July. And I knew that was going to be an incredible leveraging point. Again, it was my sales skills. It was running it as a business. It was effective communication. Now I'm put on the TV shows and the morning shows and the radio shows as I'm promoting my touring and put a touring package together for the next several years with my kids in tow. It was shifting and it was still staying in line with my passion. It was still staying in line with, it may not look like how I thought it was going to look. Yes, a lot of survival mode as well being put in there. Hunger will do a lot of things for you. (laughs) But I knew I couldn't step outside of that passion of who I was, even when it was uncomfortable. And that's what we did for the next years. Even my passion for serving the veteran and military community, it was ingrained in me since childhood. My dad was Air Force. I knew I wanted to honor our veterans. And I had been practicing the national anthem since I was three on the fireplace with the hairbrush. So that was something that I wanted to integrate. So the kids and I started serving at the USO office. And for the veterans, we would go and serve and volunteer. People that ran the USO there where we lived found out who I was as a singer and said, wait, we could use you. So now that leveled up that passion and opportunity that not only was I still serving the veterans, but I was singing the national anthem in stadiums and at amazing events and said, you know what? Why don't we take this deeper? Why don't we go in a little bit bigger? And I was able to negotiate a contract with the AMVETS with the state of California as their spokesperson. Like, look, I'm already getting asked to be at all of these great events for our veterans, deployments, coming home ceremonies, street dedications, veteran runs, you name it, we were doing it. Why don't we partner together in this? So took opportunity for the passion to combine with the business opportunity. And for the next three years, I was the spokesperson for California for the American veterans. So I'm proud of those moments. There were not cameras following me then, but it was again, just following that instinct of saying, this is who I am. This is what I'm supposed to do. And I think it really makes me an even more effective coach today because I understand just kind of that raw, pull up the bootstraps, make something happen, create something from nothing and go live it and try it. And don't be afraid of the no. I think what makes a coach so viable is that they went through the trenches already where they went through the struggle, they went through the challenges. So you don't have to go through the struggles and the challenges. So we can mitigate a lot of that trouble and the struggle. I find that to be very helpful because you can get to where you want to be a lot quicker without all the trial and error. Similar to me, I mean, I was in education. I was a former educator. And before I did that, I was an accountant. I did accounting, business finance. I was good at math and I still wanted to be a teacher. I think around fifth or sixth grade, I had this idea. It's like, I think I want to be a teacher. My sixth grade teacher, she was great. And it was kind of her, I would say. And I mean, I had a great fourth grade teacher also, but it was kind of like, I think I want to do this, but I wasn't sure yet. And I was really good at math in sixth grade. So I got like pushed up to algebra and I was supposed to be in honors algebra and math in high school. And I was fortunate enough to get an internship at a big company doing accounting and business finance for two years. So that was right out the gate of me leaving high school. So I'm 18, 19, and this is a paid internship. So making good money, 
I was like, wow, this is pretty good. And then my second year hit where I was going into work and I'm miserable. And I'm like, I can't do this for the rest of my life. I'm 19 years old and I'm miserable. And I'm like, this can't be life. So I said, well, I have a knack for teaching and education. And I said, okay, well, let me get into teaching. Started it. It's a learning curve because you have to learn how to educate, learn how to teach. It's not as simple as, okay, well, I'm going to regurgitate some stuff to you (laughs) that I've learned, and then you're going to automatically know it. It's more than that. There's a lot of personalities coming back at you that you have to navigate through while you're teaching content, right? Exactly. So you have to deal with the variety of a classroom and then also the behaviors of the individuals in the classroom, because you never know if someone didn't have breakfast because every family dynamic is going to be different. You don't know if their mom and dad had a fight that morning and now they're a little bit sad and now they're looking for attention and they don't care if it's negative. So they're going to maybe yell, scream, throw things just get your attention because that's what they're craving at that moment. I mean, any type of attention for those students, doesn't matter how they get it, they're going to get it. And it makes the teacher's life challenging. I always called those students heavy hitters. I never (laughs) said those students were bad kids. I always said they're heavy hitters because you had to really pay attention. You really had to put in some work with them. But I just love the process of education from start to finish, seeing where they are today from day one, and then seeing them on the last day. Isn't that fun? Exactly. How much progress they made. And you can see their growth, not just in their abilities, but their mind too, because they're so much stronger mentally. And they're like, I can do anything versus I'm a little timid. I'm a little you know, afraid and nervous. Right. And I think that goes into like the idea of being camera shy, where it's like, we are not 100% confident. And even when I first started teaching, I would have these students that I'm working with and day one, they're like, no, I can't do that. Like, yes, you can. (laughs) Exactly. Yes, you can. But there is a problem is they didn't have that confidence yet. So teaching was building their confidence and then also building their skill. So I wanted to get into the idea of when you start off with a new client and maybe they're trying to get into a role, maybe they're trying to start a podcast, a YouTube channel, they want to be a TikToker, whatever they want to do, right? They want to get behind the camera, but whenever they get behind the camera, they're like, um... You yeah. Know, so, uh, um, uh, uh, they, they're so <laughs> timid. They're so timid. They're so afraid. And the only person who is in that room with them is themselves. Yes. So they are with themselves all day long. But the moment you turn that camera on and it's record, they are like, I don't know how to speak English anymore or whatever it's language. Truth. Speak. So I want to kind of dive into that aspect and then how you help people through that process. Oh, Michael, you hit that head on. And I have seen it over and over and over. Amazing professionals from all walks of life miss their opportunity because of not being comfortable on camera. When I was hosting TV full time, it was a fun situation where I would be at the news desk or inside the studio. And the, our guests, a lot of them from around the country were coming in. And at the time it was Skype. So they would be waiting in Skype and I could see and hear them before I was patched through where they could see and hear me. So I would get the behind the scenes of what they were like when they didn't know the camera was on. And they were confident and laughing and joking around with whoever's micing them up or if they have their business partner. One day I actually had these two guys, they were business partners, coming in to share their business. And mind you, this is a business you put your time, heart, body, soul, and money into building, right? You would think that we're just going to go all in if we have a chance to promote this business on television. And so these guys were excited. They're like, yeah. We're excited to be here today. This is great. And they don't know I'm listening. And then the one was complimenting the other on how sexy they looked that day. I kid you not. They were like, you're looking sexy today. Well, so are you. You're looking sexy. So then they said, okay, Amy, in my ear, my producer says, are you ready to be patched through? I'm like, yeah, these guys are going to be a great interview. And the camera came on and they went, hi, hello. Yeah. And the next thing you knew, they just disappeared. I'm like, where did sexy go? Where did they go? Bring sexy back to me because that's the interview I want to give. I want to hear those guys share their business and their story. And something happens in that disconnect where people tend to freeze up. The energy drops. It's natural. The number one most common question I get from everyone is, ew, is that how I look? And is that how I sound? And do you know what the answer is? Yes. It is. It's the same face and voice you take to the grocery store. It's the same face and voice you're out with, with your family and your friends and your loved ones and everything you're doing. 
So the difference is getting comfortable with it. So it's starting with exercises to start getting familiar with number one, your own voice, and number two, your face. I think we've all heard the resting face issue. It's a real thing. Knowing what your face is doing in all expressions and taking the time to start memorizing what you look like, how you present yourself, the more comfortable and familiar you are, the same way we're familiar with a loved one. If one of my family members walks in the room and they're angry, I'm going to know it just by looking at their face, right? I also know my own face that well now. Most of us don't take the time because we're looking out, not looking in. Taking that time, and that means making phone calls in front of a mirror. It's one of the tips I give my clients right out the gate. Start making phone calls in front of the mirror. Even in the car, flip the visor down. Get familiar with what your listening face looks like, what your eyes do, what your face does, what you're representing. And what happens is, is that recognition starts to be there to where... I know what I look like when I'm thinking. I know what I'm looking like when I'm presenting something exciting or serious. Then now I'm thinking about my content because I'm not thinking about how I look anymore. I'm thinking about my message. And what will happen is there'll be a natural evolution that takes place where you're getting better and better at delivering your message because you stopped the insecurities. And the only way that that's going to happen is through self-awareness. From high school, I remember I had a public speaking class in high school. Then I went on to college, had a public speaking class. Me speaking in public wasn't really an issue. Mm -hmm. So when I became a teacher, of course, you have a classroom of kids. You know, in college, you have to go up in front of the class and teach a lesson plan for the class. Though it might be a little bit nerve wracking at first, you get used to it. It's kind of like another day in the job. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I first started teaching, where I was a little bit nervous, a little bit hesitant. But then after a couple of months, it was kind of like a piece of cake. And that's even before I got into the public schools because I was teaching swimming for children. So I was teaching that before I taught public school. And then from just my teaching one or two kids or a group of kids in swimming, I was able to translate that classroom experience or time into the public school. So as soon as I went to the public school, I have a class of 25, 30 kids or more, perfectly fine. Right. Not a problem. I'm able to just tell people what I wanted. Calm, cool, collective. It's so interesting though, because in 2018, when I started my business, and this is before the podcast and everything, I didn't have a YouTube channel. It was just me saying, okay, I need a YouTube channel and I need to create like a promotional video for what the YouTube channel is. I knew how to speak in front of thousands of people. But the moment I put that camera on me, I was like, I can't even say a word. I was like jumbling over my words. Where it's so I, normal. Yeah, I was jumbling over my words. And I was like, I know what to say off camera. But right. when the camera turns on, it's kind of like robot. It's so interesting how I went from being able to public speak to being behind a camera. And then it's totally different. It's kind of like my mind had to go through a shift. Well, 2019, hmm. 2020, the pandemic and things like that happened. It's kind of like, well, what do I do? Because I'm going to be behind the camera. It's no more in-person stuff. That's what everyone was saying. For the foreseeable future. At least that's what I was thinking. So I said, I have to get used to this. Similar to how I became a writer, I started writing a blog every week. And that weekly blog led me to writing a book. So it was me understanding the process of how I learned. And it was small steps to a bigger goal. Right. And so what I did for myself and being comfortable, I guess, on camera, you can say, was I only recorded my voice first. So I recorded my voice and I did motivational videos. So I'm on season four currently, going to be on season five, probably by the time this episode airs. And the first season... I didn't know anything about microphones or audio. There's the I learning mean, curve in that for sure. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, if you listen to season one of Motivation in Motion versus season four, right. the audio is terrible in season one. We all had to figure that out real quick. I was used to being in a studio and having producers do it for me. So we, we all had to figure that out at home. I give you mm -hmm. kudos for that. <laughs> so I made progress though, but I started without my face. And I said, okay, let me just get my voice on. And then I started to enjoy I was like, that's pretty interesting. And then I had this idea of starting a podcast. And I said, you know, I want to start a podcast. Then I was just like listening to other people's podcasts and saying, okay, well, what type of podcast would I like? Things like that. And then I started the first episode. 
and it was okay. The more you do it, the more comfortable you mm-hmm. get. I will say that. So now it's kind of like a walk in the park. So now I can go in front of a classroom. I can go in front of an audience. I can go on camera. And it's kind of like, hey, I'm going to do what I always do. And I think sometimes people think it's different where it's like, hey, just be yourself. Similar to how those two sexy guys are mm-hmm. talking before the interview. As soon as the camera hits them, they disappeared. They disappear. So how can you help people retain themselves the moment the camera turns on them or a photo is in front of them saying, okay, well, like this isn't how my face looks. So I need to fix this or something. I mean, going through that whole process, I know it's quite intricate and it can be maybe different for different people, but mm-hmm. maybe kind of give a generalization of the process. You did such a good job explaining how that practice process was for you. And it definitely starts with that practice. And everyone's at different levels when they start out. And COVID definitely amped that up. And I, even before COVID, would kind of joke if I was doing any speaking is when somebody goes live, are you the one that hits the floor? So we have the level of those that are like, all right, that can't, somebody's camera came on and I don't even want to be a background person. I don't even want to photobomb this. Get me out of here. Then you have some that are a little apprehension. All right, I'll stand behind and smile, but I'm not going to be the one talking. You got the, the medium one. And then you have the talker that's not afraid. We have to level up or now we're all the talker. And a lot of times you'll see individuals turning on that camera to go live thinking they're ready for that step. And what you end up hearing is, yeah, so um, uh, what I'm here to talk about is, and so we're at this place and then they're losing people. So what I advise on that, even to start with, is start doing these little mini clips. Just pick up your phone, record yourself. Wait, there's no need for it. I, I don't care if I record something, if I turn on my camera right now and record a quick clip of us having this interview, and then I post it on my social media 30 seconds later, do you care if it said live in the corner or that I posted it? No one cares. So I'd much rather know that I'm giving the quality. So remembering that you want to give quality, think about what you're going to say before you say it. A lot of times we're not thinking before we turn that camera on. And we just think we're going to be able to roll off the cuff, but the camera is intimidating. And so then that's not what happens. So thinking of those three talking points you have, like you're describing a plate of food. I'm going to talk about the green beans, the salad, and the main dish, and that's it. We're going to get right to the point. Because we're on social media, and you know, the, our world today, we have the attention of a goldfish, is what the statistics say. So we're swiping. If somebody doesn't get to the point in three seconds, we're like, yeah, I don't have time for you. But yet a lot of us individually, we turn on that camera, and it takes us 45 seconds to even start getting to the point. That's a problem. So think about the things that are resonating with you when you're going through social media or when you're seeing others' videos, and then start practicing those things. Look at the things you like and the things that you don't like. My other advice for getting comfortable with it, turn on the camera and do a take. Even if you never post it, never use it, and you delete it, I don't care. Turn on the camera and take two and toss one. That's what I teach everyone. Because once you get to take five, six, seven, and eight, generally it's getting worse. Unless you're an actor and you're fine tuning your script and your lines and your delivery, forget it. It is going to keep getting worse. You're most likely going to get your best take on take one or two. Stop there. Now you have to choose one. Now you're you're forced to look at it and say, which one of these am I going to choose? I have to choose one. Okay. I choose this one. And the more you start doing that, the more you're going to notice that take one and two are starting to look alike. Well, now it's not so hard of a choice. Now I'm not taking 25 takes anymore to showcase something simple. I'm doing it in one or two. Take that extra time, start looking at the tape, and then you're going to get more confident. Then the next time somebody turns their camera on live and you're at an event or you're at a party or something, you're not so intimidated. You know you're ready. You know that take one's going to be okay. And it's just that practice of doing it that's going to create the new habits. When it comes to being a coach, right? I am a big believer in walking the walk, talking the talk. Okay. If I'm a fitness coach, should I be in shape? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. I should be in shape. If I'm a media coach, should I be good at speaking? Yes, I should be, right? If I'm a mindset coach, should I have at least some type of functional mindset that's maybe balanced and positive? I would hope so. I'm a big believer in that a coach should be able to talk to talk and walk to walk. So if you're going to be a yoga instructor, guess what? You better know how to do yoga, right? (laughs) You're not going to just want to go into a yoga class and just make it up. It's not going to work for you, right? It's not going to work for the class. If class is going to know that you don't know what's going on. You don't want the yoga for dummies handbook sitting next to you on the mat. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. So we have to be confident in what we do. And I find that many of the people that I bring on coaching and session on the podcast, 
they have a level of confidence. And then even speaking with people, they have that level of confidence too. But sometimes when you take them out of that podcast, you take them out of their environment, uh, that one-on-one or that group session, it's kind of like that confidence kind of wanes. And it's kind of like, well, where did that confidence go? If you're walking the talk, you're talking the talk. And then when you're ready to act, it kind of goes away. And I think this kind of goes with our upbringing, the way we were trained as young children. When I taught music, because I taught music special ed, when I was teaching music, I had a great cooperating teacher where he says, well, we can sing as a group, but then what about the individual singing, right? When I was younger, I didn't do much individual singing. I remember I was in a play once where I had a lead role where I had to be a singer, but It wasn't like in the classroom, it wasn't individual singing. So when I was a teacher, he taught me that he's like, why not have them sing by themselves? Mm -hmm. So you have everyone sing by themselves. So it's kind of like everyone is getting a turn to be their individual self to sing the song and be confident. Going back to what we said earlier, day one to the last day, totally different kids. Because I was able to give them more confidence. And I find that when a coach can get that confidence, it doesn't even matter if you are Tony Robbins, you can take a media coach, you could take a grammar coach, voice coach, and they're going to be able to help you be better. And I mean, even I have coaches to this day, business coaches, mindset coaches, as well, because I understand the value in them. Great coaches need great coaches. Exactly. For example, Michael Jordan didn't win all those rings by himself. He had a coach. And then he even had a personal trainer, Tim Grover, who he was with Michael all the way through saying, okay, you need this, Michael, you need to do this and that. He was being coached, even though he was this great player, he had people behind him. And I think when people get into this idea of, I can do this by myself, not saying you can't, it just becomes more difficult. And when you have a team, when you have people helping you along the way, that's why there's teachers in schools and you're just not given a book. Right. Teachers are there to teach you, to help you, to see what you need. And then they give you what you need so you can be successful. Same thing with a media coach. What I notice is that people have a difficult time understanding this concept where they say, I need someone to help me get to the next level. And it's like a blind spot for many people. I mean, even when I was like jumping careers from accounting to teaching and from, and then I went back to finance and then I went back to teaching, it took a mentor to really sit down with me and say, hey, this is what you need to do. Right. This is how you need to do it. You and were retooling. Exactly. And even though I had an inclination in my mind of what I should be doing, how I should be doing it, it wasn't until that conversation with him where he sat me down and says, you need to be doing this, this lights you up. And then I went with that. And then, I mean, I haven't looked back since. I think many people, they see what's trending, they see what's popular, they see the possibilities, but they're not equipping themselves to rise to the standards of that. So kind of going into, we have a typical standard in society, you kind of briefly talked about it. Our attention span is a goldfish, right? Yes. Give me three seconds. So that's why TikToks, they try to get you. They have YouTube shorts now. There's clips, things like that. Reels on Instagram. How can we hook them in the first three seconds so we can make them watch the whole 10 seconds or the whole 45 seconds? The standards of what today are, and then maybe how people are deviating from that, or they're thinking oh, wait, I don't have to go by these standards. I'll just do what I am going to do and it's going to be great. And I find that many people, when they do that, they get burned out because they're they're disappointed with the results. Exactly. Like they're disappointed with the results and then they either stop or they say they're not good and then their confidence tanks, hits the bed and then they just stop, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, we have such a, everybody wants it right now. We have such a quick culture right now. We want to see that. We want to see the results right now. And what you've pointed out is so important. Great coaches need coaches. It's a constant daily discipline, being willing to be teachable. Am I teachable every day to resources that I can gather myself through my reading? I I love reading. I love constantly putting more tools in my tool belt, paying attention to the podcasts of the, the great mentors that I love looking up to and where I can learn and evolve, asking my elite circles that I'm in. I insert myself into mastermind groups so that I've got some confidentiality and also some accountability to say, hey, 
you know, can you take a look at this? Can you take a look at that? And it's a blend of all of those things with those daily disciplines that allows us to keep growing. The problem is, is when you put a time limit on it, well, if I'm not here at this level, by the time I'm 35, then that's it. I give up. When we take that limit off, because I'm still evolving. I mean, my goodness, I'm probably still only at the beginning of what might be ahead for me, even with the 20 plus years behind me and multiple careers that are all in one. I don't think that this was the finish line or that I'm not quite where I should be. I'm right where I'm supposed to be right now. Every day I know I'm right where I'm supposed to be right now. And there's joy in that. Thankful for the lessons learned, extremely thankful for the failures because the failures create more opportunity, allows me to look back and retool. And I'm thankful for what other opportunities are ahead. And I also share that opportunities don't always mean it's an opportunity we're supposed to take. Sometimes it's just an opportunity for discernment. So the more we keep in these circles of having the coaching, leveling up our learning, the more we're able to take opportunities that are the right ones for us. And I'm excited to see what conversations I'm going to have 20 years from now that are different from the ones that I'm having today. And it is the daily discipline. And as a media coach, as you were saying, you know, I I can't be a yoga instructor if I don't do yoga. I can't be a fitness coach if I'm out of shape. As a media coach, I'm telling you, I drive my family crazy because I speak like this in my personal life. If my daughter would go to the top of the stairs, she's, you know, she's a teenager and say, Hey mom, can you help me with something? My response is not, yeah, what? I respond, yes, honey, what can I help you with? Is there something I can do for you? Responding in a way that is effective communication, that is not using those comfort words. Yeah. So, but, um, the things that we, great taking those words out and making it a daily discipline in everything that I'm doing, constantly adding in new vocabulary. I read out loud. The only way I'm going to learn my inflections and my delivery and my pace is by reading out loud of all different types of books or some, I'll read the back of a cereal box. I don't care if that helps me be more effective in hearing my voice, getting comfortable with it. So what I teach my clients, what I speak about on podcasts, like coming on with you today, Michael, this is a part of my daily discipline. First of all, I was excited to meet you. You've got an incredible platform. You're a wonderful resource for other professionals out there. So I wanted to be a part of that. But it also is keeping me in my practice of being interviewed, of speaking, of being comfortable in front of the camera. If I stop doing this, I might lose some of my skills. So I don't do anything that I don't ask my clients to do. I do everything that they do constantly. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing. I remember when, again, going back to my swimming career or my time in college being a swim instructor, I swam with the kids. So the kids would have to do some laps and I'd say, okay, well, I'm going to swim too. And then they go, oh, well, he's swimming too, even though it's very tiring. Swimming is exhausting. So when I swam with them, they were like, well, he's swimming, so I need to swim. Right. And it wasn't kind of like, you're just bossing me around. You're telling me to do all these things. Going back to our analogy of fitness instructor, if they're not lifting weights or running on the treadmill, and then you're going and they're forcing you to go on the treadmill, it's going to be a ticking clock until you stop going. You're like, I'm not going to go. So you subconsciously make that choice in in your mind. When you look at someone, when you're speaking with someone, okay, is this person going to be able to help me? Is this person doing what they say that I'm supposed to be doing too? Because they look at that and it goes beyond this. I mean, there's something I want to talk to you about that before we go into what I'm talking about now. It's about the fear where people are afraid of being outcasted or they have a fear of being accepted or being ridiculed. Mm It's that fear. And society does such a rough service to many people because of the peer acceptance that is stemming from our school system. We're not going to dive into that because that's a whole conversation. I mean, just looking at middle school, the mindsets of all the students in middle school and around that age, a lot of hormones, a lot of ways of thinking Mm -hmm. that are going to create those limits. So when they are in high school, when they are going to college, if they do so, or they go into the career, they already have limits in their life. They have Mm -hmm. fears. Mm -hmm. They don't want to say something. They don't want to put themselves out there because of the opportunity that might be available for someone to ridicule them. Right. And they can say, oh, Amy, you know, like you think you're all that, but you're not. Because you remember when, you know, whatever they make any little thing. And then even people who are trying to find their voice. They might say, okay, I'm going to be a dancer. They put on a YouTube video and they're dancing and maybe their dance is maybe, you know, 80% good, right? So they have room for improvement, but they are not afraid to put it out there. But the negative comments, right? The negative, comments come, somebody. negative comments come 
and they say, you're not a good dancer. You should quit and you should give up and you just need to work at McDonald's or whatever they say, right? <laughs> right. They say something to keep you at a low level, to keep you from trying. And I don't know if that's a fear of failure, if that's people sure being anchors in the life, embarrassment. I mean, it kind of goes into everything and it stems. Isolation, abandonment, all of those things that go with that. Mm -hmm. And it stems at that starting point of, I want to be behind camera. I want to be a good public speaker. I want to be able to be an effective communicator with mm -hmm. my family members, my friends, with my colleagues at work. I mean, it stems all the way past that. But it starts at some point in someone's life, whether it be in school, whether it be in their career, where they have a roadblock. And then when they get behind that camera, they're like, I don't know what to say. I don't know if I should do this. When someone reaches that roadblock in their life, what do you tell them to do? My answer is always the same because I am not afraid of the failure. I'm more afraid of the regret. And at this stage in life, I've raised four kids. My kids are adults now. And I can look back at what we've been through together, touring with them. I mean, there's a lot of this backstory there. But I look back and I don't have the regret. There's a lot of failure. But I don't regret. I have more regret if I don't try. If I hadn't tried everything, if I hadn't put new music out this year when I was given that opportunity, I would have regretted it the rest of my life. Ah, what if? So for that person out there, like your example, there's that dancer out there that says, yeah, but what if I'm not good enough? But you're going to regret if you don't try. And at the end of the day, it's when we lay our head down at night and we say, okay, have I done my best today? Did I give it my all? I'm proud of where I'm at. And the self-awareness to know there's always room for improvement. I will never be done growing, evolving, shifting, changing, and trying to put more tools in my tool belt till the day, I, till the day I'm done. So willing to be coachable continually without a finish light on it and not being afraid of failure, but more afraid of regret can get you over that hump. Yeah, no, I think that's important because many people, they get stuck. Mm -hmm. And one of the main feelings I ask people, I was like, do you feel stuck? And yes. they're like, yes, I feel stuck. And then we start to go down that rabbit hole. Well, where do you feel stuck? When it's in front of the camera, it's kind of like we forget what we're supposed to say. We forget how we're supposed to be. Why not be yourself? Why not be true to who you are? And I think some people are just so afraid to be who they are, who they were meant to become. And it stops them. It stops them from living a fulfilled life. Just think about yourself, for example. If you said, you know what, I don't want to put myself out there. I don't want to be on stage. I don't want to be a singer. How many opportunities you wouldn't have today? Right missed opportunities. And then you wouldn't even have those experiences. And then you're like, okay, well, is my life really fulfilled? So now you're questioning, am I doing everything I'm supposed to be doing? And I think when we can really get past that camera shyness or the idea of, oh, my voice sounds weird. Your voice is going to sound exactly. And how... we all think that. So if yes. even the playing field, go, I think my voice is weird too. Now let's all get past it. It's mm -hmm. okay. And it's I'm, okay. And it's difficult in the beginning. I'm not going to lie to people. It's difficult in the beginning to watch yourself on camera where I remember I was conducting in college and I wasn't a good conductor. And so they would record you conducting. And I just hated watching. I was like, oh, it's so terrible. I learned from it though. And from episode one of the podcast, I learned from it. I, I do watch my content. I do edit my own content. And so I listen to everything. I make sure it sounds pleasing to the air. And it's something that I would want to listen to. I do pride myself in that, where if I want to listen to it, then I'm sure someone else will want to listen to it. Not saying that I have like this impeccable taste and that you should always listen to me, but I believe that I have something to offer. And the way I present it to people is going to be in bite-sized pieces, maybe like the 40 minute, 45 minute episodes right. can be a little bit long for some people. But I always say, hey, if you're on a ride to work, if you're at the airport, pop an episode in. And then I always tell people you can email me to say, hey, what episode should I watch if I'm looking for this? And I say, this is the person, this is the episode, or these are the episodes, this is the blog. And I give people a list of things to do. And then they're like, thank you, cool. And then they can watch them, they can read. So they're not going through all this content that they mm -hmm. might not need because then they get burned out. That kind of leads us into the burnout question, mm -hmm. where it's kind of like, there's people who have been in the online industry, coaching, radio industry for quite some time. And maybe they're on episode a thousand. Like, for example, mm -hmm. Joe Rogan's like on episode a thousand one hundred and something, or maybe like twelve hundred now 
where he's able to he's do a machine. these. Yeah, he's able to do these episodes, these podcasts, and he just keeps on chugging them out. Where it's like you would think, oh well, you know, episode two hundred, he might stop because he's, you know, he's talked to all these people and he just tired of talking, but he keeps on going. What are some methods or ways that maybe you can share with people that if they're in the realm of media, whether mm-hmm. they're a TV host, they're a podcaster, a TikToker, whatever they do behind camera or just on the voice to keep on going, to keep on pushing, to prevent burnout and to and, and to keep on finding the love in what they do and the content that they present and they put out. Well, I look at it a couple of ways. First of all, even doing this, if one person is empowered or inspired by what we're talking about today, then that is fantastic. If it's a thousand people, 10,000 people, five people, I don't care. I love the fact of one person is listening right now because I'm speaking to that one person that says, hey, I wanted to hear this. So when we're doing each episode or we're doing each interview, because I do a lot of interviews, I'm right there with you. What keeps it fresh is realizing I'm speaking to a new person today. Every time I do this, every new bit of content goes out because I'll repeat content. I have no problem repurposing content because I know that by adding new people into my following that I've got new viewers that haven't seen this content yet. So it's new to them. And if you've already seen it, swipe. I don't care. It doesn't bother me. Anytime I think about the fact that I'm reaching someone new, which each thing I do, even if I'm saying the same thing in every interview and in every episode, it's okay. It's a new audience. It's a new opportunity. And then if you get in that rut where you're like, okay, you know, take Joe Rogan, for example, he's a machine, but he loves what he does. It's in his passion and he's mixing it up by having different guests and different content, different topics that mixes it up. So if you're someone that's a host, you're a podcast host, maybe switch up the content a little bit. Say for the month of November, we're going to do all military and veteran series. So you're making it appropriate with the time of year or something like that. Well, coming up to the holidays, we're going to have all holiday related content. Do something that makes the seasons. It'll break it up in your mind. You're picturing a new audience, new work. So break up that content if that's something. If you're creating just videos for your own social media platform, break up the content so that your audience isn't seeing the same thing every time. Sometimes I'm putting up my coaching and business advice. Sometimes I'm putting up something really funny, just a candid moment in, with my own family or something that I think, all right, this shows people that I'm a real human. I can laugh at myself. I have those moments. I'll put up my own blooper outtakes clips. If I recorded something and there was good outtakes, even for my music videos, I love putting those out there because I want people to relate to me as a real human who also has those moments. So anytime I can break it up, it takes out that routine or mundane or monotony. If none of those tricks work, then maybe figure out where your passion is the most. And then you're not meant to be in media. That's okay. Then just use these skills for your virtual meetings or your presentations when you're making an impact in in the field that you do want to be in. We always want to represent our best self, even in just virtual meetings and Zoom meetings. That's where I see a lot of opportunities missed and a lot of professionals letting their guard down. You show up, even if I'm working with a client and it's not recorded, nobody's ever going to see it. I'm going to show up. I'm going to be polished. I'm going to be framed right. I'm going to have my lighting on. I'm going to have my face on. I'm going to be engaged with the camera. So you feel like I'm looking in your eyes because that person I'm meeting with deserves that respect. So we can still bring these skills into a profession that isn't on camera as far as being recorded and visible to the world. So we can kind of look at it from both of those perspectives and still find those tools that are going to work for what we're doing. To add on to the burnout idea, think of your favorite food. So let's say you like pizza. If you had pizza every single day for, let's say, a week, probably the second week you're like, I don't think I want pizza the next week. And it's not that you don't like pizza. It's just that you had it so much. You're just like, okay, well, let me get something different. So maybe get pasta. Maybe you get some soup or whatever it is. So you give that variety. So when you're recording, when you're doing different things, you offer some variety. You try different things out because you might be doing one thing. You know, if you have a media coach, they're going to say, well, why don't you try this too? Because they're going to see things that you can't most likely. And so you might be really good at talking about the news and you're not talking about the news. You're talking about, let's say you're talking about sports or something, right? So it's a little (laughs) bit different, right? So you're talking about sports, you like sports, but you just don't have that passion. But when you talk about the news, you're like, I want to inform people about this. And so you're just so much more passionate, so much more alive. And it's not saying that you can't talk about sports. It's just that you talk about your sports, then you talk about your news, and then you can share those audiences where it's like, okay, well, I wasn't really into sports, but I love this guy. I love this woman. 
who's speaking and I'm falling in love with them and how they're able to relay all that information for me. I find that to be very important for people to try different things. Even on the podcast, if you listen to some episodes, some are super political and cringy and it's kind of like, <laughs> all right, who's this guy? Did he change? It's like, I do that on purpose. And then even <laughs> motivation and motion, I just can't keep doing the same exact thing. Otherwise I would lose it. And I mean, I do most of my editing by myself because I find that I can give the episode the artistic feel yes. that I'm looking for versus if someone else comes in, not saying they're going to do a bad job. It's just that it's not going to be as right. precise and clean as what I was looking for. You it, knew what it was supposed to present. You knew the colors, you knew the flavors, you knew the style, and you knew what visuals and what you want with it. Exactly. And I think that's important. So understanding that too. So if you maybe edit your own content and you're getting burned out, mm -hmm. maybe take a break, cut back a little bit, or you can hire an editor to come in and then, you know, take a week of your content and edit it. And then when you're feeling rejuvenated and, and, go back to it. and then go back to it. Sometimes people are like, I have to do this by myself. And it's kind of like, Yes, you can do this by yourself, but you don't have to fight the war alone, right? Right. You have teammates. Know when to outsource and give yourself that break and then when you can jump back in. Mm -hmm. And understand what you love. Like, I don't like cutting the grass. I don't know why. I think it's when I was younger. I can't stand the smell of cut grass. I mean, I don't mind yeah. the smell of cut grass. I can't do it. <laughs> the problem, I think it was because when I was younger, we had properties growing up. And so we had to provide maintenance. So mm -hmm. it was painting cutting grass, all that stuff. So it took away from my friend time and my video game time when I was younger, where I'm like, I don't like this. And so now I'm an adult, I could probably cut my grass, but then I have a landscaper that will do that for me. He does a great job. And well, now, then you're in your highest and best use with what you do. Exactly. So I can be happy in what I'm doing and I can not have to worry about, okay, how long is it going to take me to cut the grass? Because that's going to be a new area of something that I might not be really keen in. So like, I might say, okay, well, how do I turn this weed whack around? And mm -hmm. it's, it's not working out for me at a lawnmower or things like that. So it could take me twice as the amount of time. So I'd lost maybe two hours versus one hour of the landscaper. Right. And valuable so, time. Exactly. So understanding your time and then managing that time. And I know when we look at a media coach, it's more than just when you get behind camera, hey, I'm going to teach you how to speak eloquently. I'm going to teach you how to be the life of the party. It's more than that. It's the balance mm -hmm. of everything that you're going to do also. Because again, you have to understand burnout is going to be a thing. You're going to have to understand that there's going to be some type of insecurities that might stem up, especially yes. if people are going to be negative Nancy's and they're going to say, Hey, I hit your face. And that might be enough to hurt you and saying, you know what, maybe I shouldn't record today. That can develop into a negative habit where now you don't record today, but the world wants you to record. It's just that you had one negative soul giving mm -hmm. you bad advice or giving you that pushback that's stopping you from your goals, your dreams, and your future. So I know, you know, our time today, Amy, was very short and brief, but if I can from you, please give us any last words and then tell people how they can find you. Well, my last words are always take the limits off. Don't put yourself in a box that you think you have to have it all by a certain time, a certain age. Realize that you can grow and evolve and get comfortable with yourself and continue learning, get coaching in any area that you feel you really want to grow. Get that coaching, ask somebody for help and start getting comfortable with who you are, what you're representing, and you will continue to become more confident on and off of the camera. But take those limits off, take those time barriers off, and just watch what can happen in your life. And anybody can reach out. I do individual and group coaching, virtual, you know, if you want to get a group together and say, let's do a webinar together, then we'll do that. You can reach me at amyscruggsmedia.com. If you just Google Amy Scruggs, you're going to find me. I promise. You'll see all my social media. You'll see the websites for Amy Scruggs Media and Amy Scruggs Music. But please reach out. If you want to have a consultation, I do free consultations. I'll send you a copy of the book and we can discuss what might be the best plan for you. And thank you so much, Michael, for this amazing platform that you've provided. Of course. And all your descriptions will be below so people can easily find you, website, social media handles. They can easily follow you, reach out to you for a consultation, a copy of the book, things like that. And of course, if any of my coaches, because I know I have a, a good coaching audience of, of coaches who might be mindset coaches or they might be communication speaking coaches, 
And they say, you know, I want to get to the next level. Working with someone is going to help you get to the next level. Again, I'm a mindset coach. I have a mindset coach because I understand that I am not going to be able to see some things. I know that I'm going to give myself limits subconsciously where I'm going to get to a point in my life. I'm going to say, you know, I'm a little bit nervous and I'm just not going to push myself when I have a mindset coach. They're going to say, hey, it seems like you're a little bit nervous and hesitant. What's going on? then I'm able to open up. And I think for some people, they have that roadblock or they have that obstacle in front of them, whether it be their relationships, career, personal life, or just being in front of a camera is so much more to life and development than our eyes might make us seem initially. So I recommend Amy for a media coach, and she's going to be able to really get you going, especially if you're a little bit timid, a little bit shy, and a little bit unsure if you have anything to say, because I'm almost certain you have something of value to say and share with the world. Make sure you can get yourself a good media coach that's going to help you unravel maybe the onion that you're in so you can finally blast something amazing. Thank you, Amy Shrugs, for coming on Coaching Session. A huge pleasure. Thank you.